But we begin tonight with breaking news, a potentially explosive development in Jack Smith's federal case against Donald Trump and his attempt to overturn the 2020 election. ABC News is reporting that Mark Meadows, Trump's White House chief of staff, was granted immunity by the special counsel in exchange for his testimony under oath before a grand jury. ABC reports that according to sources familiar with the matter, Meadows has spoken with Smith's team at least three times this year and reportedly told them that he had warned the former president about his election lies. ABC reports, quote, the sources said Meadows informed Smith's team that he repeatedly told Trump in the weeks after the 2020 presidential election that the allegations of significant voting fraud coming to them were baseless a striking break from Trump's prolific rhetoric regarding the election. According to the sources, Meadows also told the federal investigators that Trump was being dishonest with the public when he first claimed to have won the election only hours after polls closed on November 3rd, 2020, before final results were even in. Obviously, we didn't win, a source quoted Meadows as telling Smith's team in hindsight. NBC News has not confirmed this reporting, but this testimony from Meadows, one of the people closest to Trump at the time, would be critical evidence in Smith's case and his ability to establish proof beyond a doubt that Trump knew he lost and tried to overturn a Democratic election anyway. I'm joined now by Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff of California. Uh, this seems to me, uh, Congressman Schiff, to be the big one. Um, because Mark Meadows was the closest person to Trump um, and in helping him overturn the election. Your take on this news from ABC. Well, I think it is very big news. Uh, in a way, it's not surprising. Uh, people never expected Mark Meadows to be a Steve Bannon, you know, gleefully riding into jail on behalf of Donald Trump. Uh, that is not Mark Meadows. Uh, he never signed up to go to jail. Uh, he was, you know, carrying out uh, Donald Trump's uh, dirty work every day. But uh, but self-preservation has kicked in uh, and it appears that he is cooperating. Uh, you know, the challenge with him is he's written a book which was touting all the Trump lies. Uh, he's told a lot of the Trump lies himself. So he is not a perfect witness by any means. But nevertheless, you know, having him be able to confirm conversations, uh, having him be able to share first information, first hand information about what Donald Trump knew and saw, uh, any acknowledgement of his loss of the election privately while Trump was out publicly telling the big lie, all of that is still going to be very useful for prosecutors. Uh, it is. Uh, you mentioned the book, and he is now uh, allegedly, this is according to ABC's reporting, admitted that he doesn't even believe the stuff in his book. In terms of, uh, uh, you know, his usefulness to prosecutors, you did mention the book, the fact that he is now saying that he published a book, presumably took an advance and payment from the publisher and now says and is telling investigators he doesn't even believe what's in the book. How does that uh, taint or impact him as a witness? It'll certainly impact his credibility. You can imagine if he were called as a witness by Jack Smith to testify about what Trump did and said, he would be impeached with his own words in his book, uh, which is why you're going to need corroboration for what Meadows is saying, other means of proof, still useful, still important. Prosecutors will make the case, as they often do in organized crime cases, that crooks surround themselves with other crooks. Uh, and you're going to have to rely on, uh, you know, imperfect witnesses to tell the story. But, you know, for someone that close to Trump, in all the meetings uh, to essentially have flipped and be willing to talk uh, is significant. I do think more valuable witnesses are people like Cipollone, uh, the White House counsel and others that don't have quite as strong a taint as Mark Meadows. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is an important development. You add to it these other lawyers surrounding Trump, the Sidney Powells, the Jenna Ellis's, the Chesbros and others uh, and, you know, the walls start closing in on Donald Trump. Yeah, indeed. And of course, Jenna Ellis uh, now also taking a plea. Let me let you respond to that, because now you do have somebody who was in supposedly this high level team of the strike force, they called themselves. Now, two out of the three of the members of the supposed strike force, Signe Powell and Jenna Ellis, have pleaded guilty for Donald Trump. This does seem pretty dire. 
Uh, it does. You know, these are basically, I think they were referred to by, you know, the White House counsel lawyers as the clown car lawyers. Uh, you know, the team, there was Team Normal and then there was Team Clown Car. Uh, these were members of the clown car along with Giuliani. Uh, I think both Donald Trump needs to be worried about them uh, providing state's evidence, uh, but also Rudy Giuliani needs to be concerned. Uh, these were a couple of his right-hand people. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's all cumulative. You can use them to corroborate documentary evidence. Uh, you can use them to set the time and place of other meetings. Uh, they'll provide insights you can't get from others. So it's just adding to the body of evidence. And for those who wondered why is the Fulton County DA indicting 19 people in the same indictment. You can't possibly try a case with 19 people. Well, you can't. She doesn't have to anymore. Uh, every day, every week, mm -hmm. more people are pleading guilty and they're going to be taken out of the trial uh, and be added to the stable of witnesses. Absolutely. Let me read a little bit of this reporting, ABC, uh, on whether Trump acknowledged any loss. This is important to his defense. Uh, while speaking with investigators, Meadows was specifically asked if Trump ever acknowledged him that he lost the election. Meadows told investigators he never heard Trump say that, according to sources. What do you make of that? Well, I think, uh, you know, in that uh, reporting as well, uh, there is an acknowledgement by Trump when the Supreme Court rules against him. Well, well, that's it. I'm done. Uh, yeah. But he wasn't done. Uh, and he went on to challenge the election in other ways. Uh, and this is what you get with Mark Meadows. Uh, you're going to get uh, kind of a little bit on this side, a little bit on that side. Uh, that is, you know, sort of how he conducted affairs in the White House, telling each different group that appeared what they wanted to hear. And I think we're seeing more of this in the reporting about his testimony before the grand jury. Uh, but it's very characteristic of who he is. Uh, and that is, you know, quite chameleon like, which does make him challenging as a witness, not without value, potentially with significant value, but sure. uh, certainly not a uh, problem for either. As you just mentioned, uh, per the ABC, when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on December 11, 2020, denying the final court challenge, Trump told Meadows something to the effect of that's it, that's the end. Um, there's also this reporting from ABC that uh, Meadows has allegedly told investigators that Trump seemed to grow increasingly concerned as he learned about what was transpiring at the Capitol and was visibly shaken when he heard that someone had been shot there. Your thoughts on that? Well, that's that's a new insight uh, that we haven't heard. We have certainly seen in her testimony about how cavalierly he was watching these events unfold uh, in the dining room, uh, you know, calmly taking this in on the television uh, while people kept coming in and pleading with him to do something. And, you know, some of the most powerful testimony was that uh, when Meadows was being pushed uh, to get the president to do something, to call it off, uh, there was the response, well, you know, you've heard what he said, uh, essentially words to the effect of uh, he thinks Pence deserves it. Uh, and uh, and so being able to get Meadows on the record, we have, you know, this conversation secondhand from others, uh, being able to ask Meadows about that conversation and others will be really useful to prosecutors. Uh, let me play uh, Cassie Hutchinson, who was just on with uh, uh, my colleague uh, Ari Melber just a little while ago. This is what she had to say and her initial reaction to Meadows' uh, apparent cooperation. In my experience, Mark was sort of all over the board in, on, in some ways. You know, he would privately admit to me sometimes that the election, that we had lost the election, or sometimes he would privately admit to me that Trump had said that we had lost the election. But Mark also was a key player in bringing in characters like Sidney Powell and like Jenna Ellis. In my experience, he, again, he would at times acknowledge what he, what I have read in the ABC report. I mean, the all over the place, uh, you know, sort of status of Mark Meadows even came out in the January 6th hearings where he's sort of catatonic when uh, the violence is happening and says, as you said, you know, the, he doesn't want to do anything. Trump doesn't want to do anything and that he thought Pence deserved it. Cassidy Hutchinson also says in her new book that Mark Meadows burned so many papers after the 2020 election that it left his office smoky and even prompted his wife to complain that his suits smelled like a bonfire. That, to me, sounds incredibly damning. Um, getting an immunity deal when you might have been burning evidence <laughs> seems odd to me. D d do you think that at some point he will be prosecuted either by Georgia or by someone else? Uh, you know, I really can't say. I really don't know uh, whether I mean, he, is he will, in Georgia. Sorry, you know, sort of chameleon-like chameleon uh, 
uh, evade prosecution by cutting deals. Um, that that testimony from Cassidy, you know, as the former chair of the Intel Committee, was alarming to me at the time. It's alarming to me today. We were really never able to get to the bottom of what he was destroying. Uh, and I would hope that as a part of his cooperation, we get new insights on that. He might, you know, have, you know, important value, for example, in the Mar-a-Lago documents case. He might be able to shed light on how some of those documents got there his conversations with the president or warnings that were made to him and the president. Um, but uh, for the sake of national security, I hope that uh, any deal would, would also require him to be truthful about that. Um, final you know, point on that is, would it make sense to have a deal with somebody involved in that kind of conduct? Really depends on the value of their testimony. Uh, and presumably, if Smith gave Meadows immunity, it was either because it would be difficult to prosecute him or because the value of what he was getting was so significant, it outweighed the benefit of bringing him to justice. Yeah, and of course, I'm, you know, I misspoke. Of course, he is already being prosecuted in Georgia, so he is on the hook for that. Uh, Congressman Adam Schiff, thank you very much. House Republicans met today to choose their third speaker designate in three weeks. Here's a look at how that started. Sean, the tribe has spoken. Except after booting six candidates off the island, the Republican version of Survivor turned full on Lord of the Flies real fast. Now that their ability to govern themselves has devolved into full blown anarchy in a private vote, the tribe chose Majority Whip Tom Emmer of Minnesota as Speaker Designate Number Three. At least 26 members held out on Emmer. Some expressed concern over Emmer's voting record on things like certifying the 2020 election, Ukraine, and a slew of other reasons. I can't go along with putting one of the most moderate members of the entire Republican conference in the speaker's chair. That, that betrays the conservative values that I came here to fight for. How concerned are you about his vote on same-sex marriage? Uh, very concerned. Could you vote against him? Uh, yes. Uh, would you, are you gonna, is there any way you would vote for him? Uh, no. People are talking. He's had some issues uh, with the former president. I think some of the comments that he's made in the past, uh, I'm not going to get specific, but I think it's causing him some problems. Oh, just way too, too moderate and normal. Uh, his problems with the former president got worse uh, when Donald Trump, who less than 24 hours earlier said he was staying out of the speaker debacle, shanked Emmer on his fake Twitter. Trump said Emmer hadn't defended him enough was totally out of touch with Republican voters, and that voting for a, quote, globalist rhino would be a tragedy. With his shot at 217, basically DOA at that point, late today, Emmer abruptly dropped his bid. Clearly, the third time's not the charm, and Republicans are back to square one. Joining me now is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale and Tim Miller, writer at large at The Bulwark and an MSNBC political analyst. Oh, Ali. What in the fresh hell is going on in that building behind you? I have not left this hallway all day, Joy. I think you the live there now. Mood here it's where you live. That's exactly your question. I live here. Forward my mail. Someone go. Someone else go pay my mortgage because we're all installed here, and they're staying for the rest of the night. Can I just add, Joy? They're supposed to vote in about 30 minutes for another balloting round to find another speaker designate because Emmer, as you pointed out only lasted in that role for about three hours before he <laughs> pulled himself out of contention. So this is where we stand. And I have spent some time reporting over the course of the last few minutes with our colleague Scott Wong that there is now a push being floated by former Speaker McCarthy to be reinstalled as <laughs> Speaker McCarthy alongside Jim Jordan as the assistant speaker. Two points to make here, and I do hear your laughter. <laughs> Two points to make here. The first is one source who was... <laughs> I can't even continue with you. <laughs> Let me finish. One source who was briefed on this idea told me that it would work like Pelosi and Catherine Clark, speaker and assistant speaker. So there is technically a precedent for this, but there is also very much an office reference here about Dwight being the assistant to the regional manager, and I think that's probably more apt because, as your laughter suggests... This is probably not going to happen, but it's being floated, and we just report the we just report the news here, Joy. <laughs> Tim, you want to be speaker? 
mean, at this point, uh, they just need I somebody to do the job. I was to me as speaker designate. Uh, <laughs> I was with the title that I'm going for going forward. Uh, everybody gets to be speaker designate. It is a title without a job, apparently. And so why not me? I mean... <laughs> But I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to me to laugh at your great reporting, but Tim, so you mean, so, so, so this is what we're doing. Kevin McCarthy said, I have a bright idea. Me, me, I'll be speaker. It's the thing I've always wanted anyway. Just give it back to me. Like that's the, is this ever going to end? Can I mean, Allie go home at some point? I don't think Allie can go home. And, and she home, might Tim. end up being speaker designate um, as well at some point. Uh, a lot of people getting the title. Uh, my Kevin, uh, why not my Kevin? I mean, he's gotten the most votes so far. I, I think, uh, you know, he didn't have 20, 217, but he had more votes than Scalise and more votes than Jordan and more votes than Emmer. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe they should go back to my Kevin. Uh, here's the problem, uh, Joy and, and Ali, uh, in seriousness. Like, the, the thing is, the MAGA wing has control over this here. And, and, and these guys might not want to believe that. And maybe I think they're hoping that one day that the MAGA weirdo caucus was going to wake up and they're just going to be like, oh, fine, we'll go with Tom Emmer, just the same thing as Kevin McCarthy. But why would they do that? They have the, the Republican voters are with the arsonists. You know, if this is a dumpster fire uh, that has been started by Matt Gates, like the Republican voters are with the people lighting the fire in the dumpster. And, and so, uh, you know, and, until those people agree on someone, I, I guess I don't understand why they keep voting. Like they really should just right. get the 30 craziest members together and say, <laughs> you guys give us a list of who you would accept. Right. And, then, and then we can decide from that list. Uh, that would be my advice on how to move forward or and i feel like it's groundhog day i've been saying this on msnbc for three weeks or all it takes is five of them to just walk down the hall and any one of those five could be the speaker and i don't understand at this point why not one of them want to see a see a portrait of themselves don bacon you know Kay granger get your portrait all you got to do yes. is knock on hakeem jeffrey's door and bring four <laughs> of your friends with you maybe three of your friends depending on who shows up to vote on a given day so uh that could happen but unfortunately it doesn't seem like anybody wants to do that well, let, that, Allie, let, let's go back to you, since you do live there, and so you, you know everybody there. It, are there five Republicans, or are Republicans behind the scenes having that conversation? Because it seems to me that the only people who can get anywhere have to have denied the election. So that's number one, right? You have to have denied the election. Yeah. But, are there some of the normies left who are talking about maybe just cutting a deal with Democrats and getting a speaker in place. It would still be a Republican, likely still very conservative, more conservative than most Democrats would like, but at least there'd be someone doing the job. So I entertained some McCarthy fan fiction for you, and although it was well reported by my colleague and Scott Wong and I, I do think it's extremely far-fetched. I will now entertain some consensus government fan fiction for you and your audience, which is that in theory, that's very logical to have someone cross party lines and go to Hakeem Jeffries' door and say, hey, let's do something so that this place just works again. But I don't think that's going to happen. I almost think that when we apply too much logic to this scenario, it's where it gets really frustrating and where it doesn't work anymore. Because there is no logic that seems to be functioning behind this, Joy and Tim. I think we're just squarely in a place where... Republicans only want to do this by themselves. Even the most frustrated and so-called moderate among them are still not willing to cross party lines. And Democrats, even last week, continued to say, Catherine Clark said on the floor when she was nominating Hakeem Jeffries yet again, she said, take yes for an answer. Democrats are willing to empower pro Speaker Pro Tem McHenry. That idea seemed to have died on the vine among Republicans, but there were Democrats that I talked to who were actually very behind it and would have happily, both politically at home and pragmatically here in Washington, happily backed that as an idea. But within this Republican conference, it again seems dead on arrival. And so, yeah, if we're entertaining fanfic, sure, there's a world yeah. in which that happens. But I just don't really see it here.